Welcome to Module 3 of DLS 105, Risk Calculation Examples. In this module, we will expand on what was covered in Module 2 to cover some of the more complicated but common risk assessment examples. We will cover examples for spillway gate and operability and debris blockage, along with earthquake failure modes for dam embankments and gated structures. We'll then finish up by covering the equations used for risk reduction evaluations. Let's get right into it, starting with spillway gate and operability. As we learned in Module 1, operational performance is modeled in the project event tree using a discrete function. Discrete functions are used to represent discrete random variables that can take on only a finite number of values with each value being represented by a separate branch. The number of branches is selected to match the number of discrete values that the variable can take on, with each discrete branch being assigned a probability of occurrence. In this example, the discrete random variable is Tanner gate and operability for a spillway containing two Tanner gates. As such, three discrete function branches are required, zero gates inoperable, one gate inoperable, and two gates inoperable. The discrete probabilities will typically be informed by a fault tree analysis and the RMC's event combination toolbox. Fault trees, as will be discussed in the next few slides, can be used to calculate the probability of inoperability for each gate, and the event combination toolbox can be used to calculate the discrete probability for each gate inoperability scenario. A fault tree is a graphical construct that shows the logical interaction among the elements of a system whose failure, individually or in combination, could contribute to the occurrence of a defined undesired event, such as a system failure. A fault tree starts not with events possibly contributing to failure, but with the failure state itself, and it asks what might need to happen for that failure state to occur. As such, it is a top-down deductive failure analysis in which an undesired state of a system is analyzed using Boolean logic to combine a series of lower level events. This slide illustrates the basic fault tree structure. The top event defines the system failure. Logic gates describe the relationships between sub-events. Sub-events include intermediate on down to basic events. The primary use of fault trees in dam safety are with mechanical and electrical systems. Because a dam is not easily broken down into a fully enumerated set of components, and because it is not easy to link failures among a subset of those components to subsequent failures of others, fault tree analysis is difficult to apply in practical dam safety studies, and event tree analysis is the common approach. Fault tree analysis uses Boolean logic, which is a branch of algebra in which all operations are either true or false, yes or no, and all relationships between the operations can be expressed with logical operators such as AND, OR, or NOT. For the AND operator, all conditions must be present for the operation to be true. For the OR operator, the operation is true if any of the conditions are present. It is inclusive. Lastly, for the NOT operator, the operation is true if a specific condition is present, but the others are not. For example, in this simple fault tree, we have one AND gate. We are asked to calculate the probability that both the emergency and commercial power backups fail. Because we have an AND gate, for there to be a power system failure, both the commercial power backup and emergency power backup must fail. We can look at this top event as a Venn diagram. For the intersection of the independent events, the probability of interest is the intersection of the two event circles. Therefore, to obtain the intersection of the events, the individual event probabilities are simply multiplied as shown. In this second example, we are asked to calculate the probability of a gate failing to operate on demand given the three events or faults shown. Failure of the gate operation controls, the gate mechanical drive, or the electrical power source. Here we have an OR gate. For a gate to fail to operate on demand, any one of the events or faults listed must occur. 
We can again look at the top event as a Venn diagram. For the union of independent events, the probability of interest is the area bounded by the perimeter of the three event circles. The intersection of the events must be subtracted from the sum of the areas to avoid double counting. After subtracting the individual pairs of intersecting events, the intersection of all three events must then be added back in. A simpler way to get the same result would be to take one minus the probability none of the three events occurs. This is known as De Morgan's rule, which I will cover in more detail a bit later. Before getting back into event trees, let's take a look at a couple more examples of fault trees. Here is a relatively simple fault tree for a wire rope drive system. It was created using Isograph's reliability workbench used by the Corps of Engineers. The system fails if any of the components fail, as indicated by the use of an OR gate. Events are numbered for tracking. Q corresponds to the probability of unreliability or unavailability, presumably because it's next to R in the alphabet, and R is commonly used to represent reliability or availability. Thus, Q equals one minus R. Eta, the characteristic life, and tau, the inspection or operation interval, are variable used in the dormant Weibull formula. Failures remain dormant or hidden until the system is needed or until failures are discovered during scheduled inspections. Characteristic life is traditionally gathered through testing of thousands of samples in a controlled laboratory environment. The Corps of Engineers has performed an extensive data collection of its mechanical and electrical equipment on flood risk management projects throughout the U.S. Results from this field data collection were sent to the University of Maryland Reliability Analysis Center to determine the characteristic life and beta shape parameters using Bayesian Weibull analysis. See Chapter G4 in the Best Practices Manual for more details on input variables to the dormant Weibull formula. Here is an example of a fault tree for a flood control gate. There are many components comprising the mechanical and electrical system. Often, if one of the components fail, then the entire system fails. Teams should sift through the various components to determine which ones are driving the system failure. Next, we will cover one last topic before doing an exercise and diving into a risk assessment example. Binomial theorem and Pascal's triangle were both covered in best practices, but we're covering them again here because of their applicability to risk assessments on projects with gated structures and the reliability of those gates. When we have statistically independent events for which the order of outcomes does not matter, binomial theorem can be used to calculate the probability of the different potential outcomes. The relationship shown here is helpful when we have assessed the probability of failure of an individual gate, either through structural analysis or a fault tree analysis, that we can then assume to be consistent for each of the spillway gates because they were all constructed the same way and at the same time. Once we have the probability of failure for a single gate, we need to apply that to calculate the probability of failure for a series of gates, where more than one gate can fail. Depending on the number of gates, there will be a variety of scenarios to evaluate, such as exactly one gate failing, exactly two gates failing, and so on and so forth. To do this, we will use the equation on the slide. The variable P would be for the gate failure probability. N would be the total number of gates, and K would be the number of gates that we assume to fail for a given scenario. To solve this equation, and to make the math a little easier, we can get the result of the first term using Pascal's triangle instead of computing a bunch of factorials. In the triangle, each row corresponds to a specific n, starting with n equals zero. Within the row, each box corresponds to the value k, starting with k equals zero at the far left, and moving up one for every box you move to the right. Count over to the value of k, and the number in the box will be the first term in the equation. So stepping through an example should help make this clear. Let's say we have four spillway gates, each with a 0.1 probability of not opening. To calculate the probability of exactly two gates not opening, we can use Pascal's triangle. Because we have four gates, n equals four. 
because we want to know the probability of exactly two gates not opening, k equals 2. So we find the row for n equals 4, then across the row to k equals 2, not forgetting that the first row is for n equals 0, and the first column is for k equals 0. And then we get the value of 6 for our first term. We plug our values into the equation using a probability of 0.1 for p, and we get a probability of 0 0.0486 for the probability of exactly two gates not opening. If you do not want to use Pascal's triangle, Microsoft Excel has a nice function built in that will do the calculation for you called binome dist. The first input is k, the second is n, and the third is p. The last input will either be true or false. To select a cumulative distribution to get the probability of k or fewer gates not opening, input true. To get the probability of exactly k gates not opening, input false. So redoing the example from the previous slide where k equal 2, n equal 4, and p equal 0.1, we choose false because the question asked for the probability of exactly two gates not opening. And as shown in the red box, you can see we get a probability of 0 0.0486, which is the same as we calculated earlier using Pascal's triangle. When we have gates, we must consider all the different inoperability conditions because each scenario impacts the stage frequency differently. If we are looking at gate failures, the incremental consequences will be different for each scenario and will increase for the scenarios where more gates fail. These calculated probabilities become an important part to a complete and defendable risk estimate. This brings us to our first exercise, binomial distribution. Please open up the Module 3 exercise and homework file from the course material now. This file will have separate tabs for the exercises that we will do during the module. The exercise asks, given eight spillway gates, each with a probability of 0 0.05 of not opening, what is the probability of five gates not opening? And what is the probability of at least three gates not opening? If you decide to complete the exercise using Microsoft Excel, I've included the formula on the slide. Please pause the video and work through the exercise. When you're finished, press play for the solution. Here is the solution. We have eight spillway gates, so n equals eight. And for the first question, we wanna know the probability of exactly five gates not opening, so k equals five. P is equal to 0 0.05, so we can plug it into the equation I provided. K is the first term, n is the second term, P is the third term, and we type in false for the last term, since we do not want a cumulative probability. We want the probability of exactly five gates not opening. This returns a probability of 1.5 times 10 to the minus five. For the second question, we need to be careful and use a little critical thinking because the question asks for the probability of at least three gates not opening. To do this, we can calculate the probability of two or less gates not opening. Then by subtracting the probability of two or less not opening from one, we can get the probability of three or more gates not opening. So we have one minus our binomial distribution function with k equals two, n is still equal to eight, and p is still equal to 0 0.05. This time we want to choose true, so the formula will return a cumulative probability, the probability of two or less not opening. From this equation, we get the answer to be 5.79 times 10 to the minus three. Another way to answer the second question is to calculate the probability of exactly three gates not opening, and exactly four gates not opening, and exactly five, exactly six, exactly seven, and on up to exactly eight gates not opening, and then sum those probabilities. You'll see that we'll get the same result, a probability of 5.79 times 10 to the minus three. From this table, you can also see how the probability is drastically lower when more and more gates are assumed not to open.
Practically, when doing a risk assessment, you can use these results to prune branches from the event tree, such as the seven and eight gate failure scenarios, because of the remote probabilities. The probabilities for the seven and eight gate failure scenarios are so low that they will have a negligible contribution to the total project risk. To make things a bit easier, the RMC's event combination toolbox can be used to assess the probability of K or more gates failing or exactly K gates failing. Here's the solution to the previous exercise using the identical probabilities worksheet from the toolbox, since each gate has the same probability of not opening. Simply input the probability of a single gate failure P and the total number of gates N in the yellow boxes, and the spreadsheet will do the rest. In the previous example, each gate had the same probability of failure. However, if each gate has a unique probability of failure, it gets more complicated. Each scenario must be accounted for. The unique gates worksheet in the RMC's event combination toolbox can be used to assess up to six gates, each with a different or unique probability of failure. Failure probabilities are highlighted in red, and the unhighlighted values are probabilities of not failing, one minus the failure probabilities. In this example, there are five gates, and each gate has the unique probability of failure shown in the top row. To obtain the probability of one gate failing, the calculations are shown. The probability of only gate one failing is obtained by multiplying the probability of gate one failing by the probability of each of the other gates not failing. The process is repeated for each of the other five gates, and the results are summed. The solution from the toolbox is shown in the summary table at the bottom right. For example 3.1, we are given a project of entry with gate and operability scenarios and three potential failure modes. PFM1 is backward erosion piping and is a function of peak stage. PFM2 is concrete line spillway erosion which is a function of spillway outflow. And PFM3 is overtopping and is a function of overtopping depth. The project of entry does not include branches for economic consequences. These branches were pruned from the event tree because we are going to solely focus on calculating the life safety risk. Calculating the economic risk follows the same procedure as calculating the life safety risk, but uses dollar and cents instead of statistical fatalities. The first thing we need to do is discretize the hazard. The spreadsheet gives us space for 20 intervals, and we are going to use even intervals. To start, we begin to fill out the table using the minimum and maximum stages defined by the stage frequency relationship. To compute stage two for the first interval, we use the equation at the top of the sheet. We have 20 partitions, so n equals 20. Take the stage one elevation and add to it the quantity of the maximum stage minus the minimum stage divided by n minus one, which is equal to 19. For the next interval, stage one will be equal to stage two from the prior interval. From here, we can drag the formulas to complete these two columns. And when doing so, we get the following. Next, we are going to interpolate to get the annual exceedance probability for each stage. We will use lin z int, linear for stage, and z variate for AEP because all stage frequency curves are plotted on a probability scale. So we interpolate for stage one. And then again for stage two. Then drag the formulas down to complete the columns. The hazard probability will be equal to the stage 1 AEP minus stage 2 AEP, but we will need to add the non-exceedance to the first interval's hazard probability. So in the first interval, we will add 1 minus the stage 1 AEP. For the second interval, we simply subtract the stage 2 AEP from the stage 1 AEP.
That probability can be found under the stage 2 AEP for that interval. That completes the table. Although it is not done on the slide, go ahead and sum the hazard probabilities out to the side to verify they sum to 1. If done correctly, you will get the values on the screen, and these values will sum to 1. Next, scrolling down past the transform functions that we will use later, we come to the PFM risk assessment data and need to calculate the probability of each gate in operability scenario. We are given a single gate in operability probability, which can be applied to each gate. As such, we can do what we did in exercise 3.1 to calculate these probabilities. When we are finished, these probabilities should sum to 1. We are going to use Microsoft Excel's binome dist function to calculate the probabilities. For the zero gates in operable condition, the first input is zero for the number of gates in operable, then a two for the total number of gates, followed by the inoperability probability, and then false because we want the discrete probability, not the cumulative probability. Moving down a row, the formula is the same, but the first input will be a 1 because we are calculating the probability of one gate being inoperable. Then in the last cell of the table, same thing, but for two gates being inoperable. Once complete, the table should look like this, with a set of three probabilities that sum to 1. Next, we will calculate the marginal risk for each potential failure mode, starting with PFM1, backward erosion piping. We will start by using the midpoint stage of each interval to interpolate the PFM1 SRP. The instructions tell us to use a log transformation for all SRPs except overtopping, so we will use the lin log int interpolation function. Once we have the SRP, we can multiply it by the hazard probability to get the annual probability of failure. We'll do that here, and that gives us the APF for the first interval. If we have appropriately locked the cells in the SRP interpolation function, we can drag the SRP and APF formulas down to complete each column. The marginal APF for PFM1 will be the sum of the APFs across all intervals. And that is equal to 9.03 times 10 to the minus 6. Now we need to look at the life loss and calculate the average annual life loss. We will start by linearly interpolating the day breach life loss using the midpoint stage of the interval. We'll do the same thing in the next step, but for the night breach life loss. That gives us the following breach life loss values. Next, we repeat that process using the non-breach life loss table. First for the day, followed up by the night. And now we have all the life loss values we need to calculate the incremental life loss for the first interval. The incremental life loss is equal to the breach consequences minus the non-breach consequences. We will do that calculation for the day exposure scenario first. And again for the night. The exposure weighted incremental life loss is equal to the day exposure multiplied by the day life loss plus the night exposure multiplied by the night life loss. We now have everything we need to calculate the Average Annual Life Loss, or AALL. The Average Annual Life Loss is equal to the Annual Probability of Failure times the Exposure Weighted Incremental Life Loss. With the first row of the table complete, we can drag those formulas down, provided we remember to lock the appropriate rows and columns of the formula inputs. That finishes out the marginal risk table for PFM1. The total average annual life loss for the failure mode 
is equal to the sum of the average annual life losses in the table, which comes out to be 1.49 times 10 to the minus 3. To finish out the PFM1 calculations, we calculate n bar by dividing the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure. And we get 165 lives per failure. We will continue by doing the same calculations for PFM2, but first we need a transform because the system response for PFM2 is a function of spillway discharge, not peak stage. We will interpolate from the 100% reliable stage to spillway gate discharge relationship to get the transform, linear for stage and logarithmic for outflow. Because we are calculating the marginal risk for this failure mode, we must assume 100% reliability of the spillway gates and use the discharge for the zero gates inoperable scenario. Next, we use the discharge value we just calculated to interpolate for the PFM2 system response. Both discharge and SRP need to be log transformed, so the interpolation function will be log log int. We can then drag those formulas down to complete the first two yellow columns in the table. Like we did for PFM1, we can then calculate the APF for each interval and sum the results. Then, also like we did for PFM1, we interpolate to get breach life loss, calculate the weighted incremental life loss, and calculate the average annual life loss using the data for PFM2 to get the results in the top left table. Continuing to overtopping PFM3. The SRP for PFM3 is a function of overtopping depth, so we will need to transform from stage to overtopping depth by subtracting the top of dam elevation from the midpoint stage. When the stage is below the dam crest, the overtopping depth is zero, so it is best to set up an if statement to cover those situations. As shown in row 140, Top of dam is at elevation 649.7 feet. We get the following overtopping depths and we'll use these depths to interpolate the PFM3 system response. We linearly interpolate for the PFM SRP. Then we will complete that process for all intervals and calculate the APF. Then like before, we interpolate to get breach life loss, calculate the weighted incremental life loss, and calculate the average annual life loss using the data for PFM3 to get the results in the top left table. Now that we have the marginal risk calculated for each PFM, we need to adjust the probabilities using the competing risk model and calculate the total risk for the project. We'll start by calculating the complements for each SRP by taking 1 minus the marginal SRP. From here, we will adjust the system response probabilities using the competing risk model. For the first hazard interval, the adjusted system response for PFM1 will be equal to the marginal system response probability times 0.5 times the quantity of the product of the PFM2 and PFM3 complements plus the product of 1 minus 0 times 1 minus 0. The product of the PFM2 and PFM3 complements is the survival function at hazard Q1, and the product of 1 minus 0 times 1 minus 0 is the survival function at hazard Q0, because all PFMs have a zero system response probability at Q0. For the second interval, we take the adjusted system response at Q1 and add to it the change in the marginal probability from Q1 to Q2 times 0.5 times the sum of the product of the PFM2 and PFM3 complements at Q2 
and the product of the PFM2 and PFM3 complements at Q1. We can drag that down and then we will repeat the process for PFM2 and PFM3. With the calculations for this table complete for zero gates inoperable, we move to the one gate inoperable calculations. Interpolate from the transform data to get the midpoint stage for the one gate inoperable scenario and drag the formula down. Notice that once the pool exceeds top of active storage, the stages are higher when a gate is inoperable. This makes sense because with a gate inoperable, the project cannot release as much water as intended, which causes the reservoir to rise. Next, we need the spillway discharge and we'll use the linlog int function to interpolate. We are given the discharge as a function of the 100% reliable stage, so we need to use the zero gates inoperable stage in column D when we interpolate not the transform stages for one gate inoperable in column P. Extend that formula down to complete the column. The overtopping depth is a function of the transform stage, so we can transform from stage to overtopping depth by subtracting the top of dam elevation from the midpoint stage. As before, set up an if statement to return a zero when the stage is less than the top of dam elevation, 649.7 feet. And the completed column looks like this. The next step is to interpolate to get the marginal system response probabilities for each failure mode. PFM1 is a function of the transformed midpoint stage. PFM2 is a function of the spillway discharge, and PFM3 is a function of the overtopping depth. Now, repeat the entire process to fill out the table for the two gates inoperable scenario. Interpolate to get the transform stage. Interpolate to get the spillway discharge. Remember to use the zero gates inoperable stage to interpolate, not the stage transformed for two gates inoperable. Then write an if statement to calculate the overtopping depth for the scenario. Interpolate to calculate the marginal system response probabilities. And complete the complement and competing risk calculations to finish out the table. We are finally ready to calculate each potential failure mode's contribution to the total risk. First, we need to pull the probability of the zero gates inoperable scenario, which is equal to 0.723. Next, we need the adjusted system response probabilities for PFM1 that we calculated in the table above, so we can reference those cells here. The APF, per the project of entry, is equal to the hazard probability times the gate scenario probability times the system response probability as shown here. Here are the completed columns. Next, we interpolate to get the breach life loss and non-breach life loss using the stage for the zero gates and operable scenario. We subtract the non-breach life loss from the breach life loss to get the incremental life loss and compute the weighted incremental life loss by multiplying the day exposure by the day incremental life loss 
and adding to it the product of the night exposure and the night incremental life loss. The average annual life loss is the APF multiplied by the weighted incremental life loss. Here is the completed table. Now we get to repeat everything we just did, but for the one gate inoperable scenario. Pull in the one gate inoperable probability to get started. Pull the one gate inoperable adjusted PFM1 system response probability from the table above. Calculate the APF by multiplying the hazard probability by the gate scenario probability and the system response probability for the first hazard interval. For the life loss interpolation, the breach life loss will be a function of the one gate inoperable transform stage, whereas the non breach life loss will be a function of the zero gates inoperable stage. Calculate the day, night, and weighted incremental life loss. Then calculate the average annual life loss by multiplying the annual probability of failure by the weighted incremental life loss. Repeat all the prior steps for the two gates in operable scenario to get the APF values shown here. and the average annual life loss values here. The procedure is more or less the same for PFM2 and PFM3, so we will not cover these calculations in as much detail. You can review the calculations in your companion spreadsheet by referencing the example 3.1 solution worksheet. One thing of note is that life loss is a function of stage, which is not found in the PFM2 table. Because the hazard intervals are the same, reference the midpoint stage from the PFM1 table when interpolating for life loss. Another thing to note is the non-breached life loss will be the same across all failure modes and across all gate inoperability scenarios because it assumes 100% reliability and intended operation regardless of the gate inoperability scenario under consideration. So the non-breach life loss for PFM3 is the same for zero gates inoperable as it is for one gate inoperable as it is for two gates inoperable. The total annual probability for the project will be the sum of the calculated APF values across all failure modes and gate inoperability scenarios. In the formula bar, you can see that there are three ranges included for PFM1, three for PFM2, and three for PFM3. These are the APF values associated with each of the three gate inoperability scenarios. We will then sum the average annual life loss values like we did for the annual probability of failure. And then n bar will be equal to the average annual life loss divided by the annual probability of failure. The total annual probability of failure comes out to be 9.71 times 10 to the minus 5. And the total average annual life loss comes out to be 8.98 times 10 to the minus 3. But how much of the risk is attributable to gate inoperability? To find out, we need the risk associated with 100% reliability. We can then subtract the risk associated with 100% reliability from the total risk, including gate inoperability, shown on the slide. The difference is the risk associated specifically with gate inoperability. To get the risk for the 100% reliability case, we can simply change the probability of single gate inoperability in cell D127 to zero. 
and the spreadsheet will handle the rest of the calculations. As shown, changing the single gate probability to zero results in a probability of one for the zero gates in operable scenario, and a probability of zero for the other two scenarios. Here's how the results change and the calculation of the gate inoperability risk, which is equal to the total with gate inoperability minus the 100% reliable stage. Counting for debris blockage is very similar to what we just looked at for gate inoperability. There are only a few important differences that you need to be aware of. As you can see, the project of entry is nearly the same as for gate inoperability, except the gate inoperability scenarios have been replaced with debris blockage scenarios. Debris blockage is typically estimated as a cumulative density function, or CDF. Therefore, some additional steps are necessary to calculate the probability of each debris blockage scenario. Here's an example of a family of debris blockage cumulative density functions. A cumulative density function was estimated for six different reservoir stages and four different debris blockage scenarios. Each blockage has its own stage frequency relationship. To go from the CDF to a discrete probability, we first need the midpoints between the debris blockage scenarios, as shown here. The first interval ranges from 0% to 5% blockage and is represented by the 0% blockage stage frequency curve. The second interval ranges from 5% to 17.5% and is represented by the 10% blockage stage frequency curve. The third interval ranges from 17.5% to 57.5% and is represented by the 25% blockage stage frequency curve. And the last interval is for debris blockage greater than 37.5% and is represented by the 50% blockage stage frequency. So now that we have things split up, we can calculate the probability of the debris blockage scenarios. We are given the cumulative probability of debris blockage in the first table. We will then find the cumulative probability for the midpoint between debris blockage scenarios by averaging the cumulative probabilities for a given stage range. Then for the last table, we create intervals using the 0% blockage scenario and the three midpoint blockage scenarios. The probability for a given interval is calculated by taking the cumulative probability of the first percentage that defines the range and subtracting from it the probability of the second probability that defines the range. Once complete, the probabilities calculated for each interval should sum to one. Now that we know how to calculate debris blockage percentages from a CDF, let's move to example 3.2. Because nearly all the debris blockage calculations are the same as for gate inoperability, we are only going to focus on calculating the probability of the debris blockage scenarios in this presentation. So for right now, your job is to calculate the probability of the debris blockage scenarios. Please pause the video now and complete this part of the example. When you are finished, press play to resume the video. We will start by computing the cumulative probability for the midpoint blockage scenarios. This is a simple average of the probabilities on either side of the midpoint, which is from the 0% and 15% blockage scenarios for the first cell. It is the average cumulative probability of the 15% and 25% blockage scenarios for the second cell. So we calculate a cumulative probability of 0.625 for the 7.5% blockage scenario and a 0.125 probability for the 20% blockage scenario. 
Next, to get the probability associated with the scenarios in the final table, we subtract the cumulative probability for the second debris blockage percentage that defines the range from the first debris blockage scenario. The first range is 0% to 7.5%, so we will take 1 minus 0.625 for the first cell. For the second cell, we take 0.625 minus 0.125. And for the last cell, we take 0.125 minus 0. We can then drag the formulas in both tables to the right to complete the calculations. You will notice that the 7.5% to 20% blockage probability is 0.5 for all stages. This will always be true when only three scenarios are evaluated in the very first table. When there are more than three scenarios, the calculated probabilities will be unique. From here, you are welcome and encouraged to complete all the calculations for the example. The solution is provided in the companion spreadsheet to help you along. Next, let's look at seismic failure modes and how coincident hazards change the calculations. Seismic failure modes get a little more complicated because the system response becomes a function of both earthquake and stage, but calculations will generally follow the same process. Here's how it would look in an event tree format where we have the branches for the different PGA intervals, and then for each of those ground motions, we will have a full set of intervals for the flood duration, which leads into the failure branches. The annual probability of failure is still equal to the hazard probability times the system response, and the average annual life loss is still equal to the annual probability of failure times the exposure weighted consequences. Note that for pool, we are using the stage duration curve, not the stage frequency curve. We do this because we want to know what fraction of time in a year the reservoir exceeds a specific stage. We can then multiply that by the annual probability of a specific earthquake to get the combined and coincident probability. Instead of being able to do the calculations one column at a time, each column becomes a table for a seismic failure mode. Two-way interpolation for the system response probabilities will be required. Past that, all the calculations are the same, there's just a lot more of them. This brings us to example 3.3, where we will calculate the risk for a seismic embankment failure mode. Pay close attention to this example because you will be doing very similar calculations for homework 3 at the end of the module. In this example, we are given a simple event tree, the seismic hazard relationship, and the stage duration relationship. Our first task is to calculate the joint loading probabilities. We will start by interpolating off the stage duration relationship to get the duration exceedance probability for each headwater of the ranges at the top of the table. The headwater ranges were given to us in this example, but to get even intervals, we would follow the same discretization procedure that we've been using for the stage frequency of hydraulic hazard failure modes. We will always use linear interpolation when interpolating from a stage duration relationship. Once we have those probabilities, we subtract the duration exceedance probability, or DEP, for headwater B from the DEP for headwater A. We were told to include non-exceedance in the first interval. But because the DEP for headwater A is 1, we do not need to add anything. The non-exceedance probability would be 1 minus 1, which is equal to 0. We can drag the relationships to the right to complete the first few rows. The only formula that will be different is the last one, where we have the exceedance probability. The probability will be equal to the DEP of elevation 2108.5, which is 1.29 times 10 to the minus 6.
Next, we will follow the same procedure for the seismic hazard, but we will use semi-log interpolation. Using linlog int, we interpolate the annual exceedance probability of PGA A. And again for the PGA B AEP. We can drag that formula down to complete all but the last row of the table. The last row is for the exceedance probability, which will be the AEP for a PGA of 1G. Like for the headwater at the top of the table, the PGA intervals were given to us. If we'd been required to generate these intervals on our own, we would have used the same discretization procedure described in Module 2, just like we did for the headwater a few slides ago. Subtract the AEP for PGA-B from the AEP of PGA-A, but include the non-exceedance probability in the first cell, which is equal to 1 minus the AEP of PGA-A. And again, the last probability in the column will be for the exceedance probability. To get the joiner coincident probability, we will multiply the headwater probability by the PGA probability to complete the table. Be sure to lock the headwater row and the PGA column in the formula so that you can drag it over and down. When done correctly, the sum of all the joint probabilities will sum to 1, as shown here. With the joint loading probabilities complete, let's move to the PFM risk calculation, starting with the system response table. We are told to use linear interpolation because of all the zeros in the system response, so we will use the bilinint function. The first input into the formula is the midpoint headwater. The second is the midpoint PGA, followed by the headwater range from the system response table and the PGA range from the same table, then the system response probabilities, followed by two ones since both the PGA and stage are in ascending order, followed by two zeros because we are not extrapolating. In the formula, lock the row for the initial headwater input and lock the column for the initial PGA input. Lock both rows and columns for all other cell references in the formula so that we can drag and drop. Here is the completed system response table. Next, we will calculate the annual probability of failure. The annual probability of failure is equal to the joint loading probability multiplied by the system response for each interval. Then we'll drag and drop to finish out the table. Next, we need our exposure weighted life loss. Life loss is a function of stage, not PGA. As such, life loss will only change with a change in stage. It will not change with a change in PGA. To get the incremental life loss, we interpolate using the midpoint stage. The incremental life loss is equal to the day exposure times the quantity of the day breach life loss minus the day non-breach life loss plus the night exposure times the quantity of the night breach life loss minus the night non-breach life loss. Be sure to lock the rows and columns for the exposure values in the formula and lock the row for the stage inputs. Drag and drop to complete the table. The average annual life loss will then be equal to the annual probability of failure multiplied by the exposure weighted life loss. Now we are ready to sum things up again to get the total risk for the failure mode. Sum all the annual probability of failure values from the annual probability of failure table to get the total annual probability of failure. Sum all the average annual life loss values from the average annual life loss table to get the total average annual life loss. Then divide the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure to get n bar.
The resulting FN plot will look like this, with the total plotting just above the low probability high consequence box. For seismic failure modes, the RMC joint loading probability toolbox can be used to develop the joint loading matrix and to help screen them for inclusion as potential risk drivers. This toolbox can be downloaded from the RMC website under Software, RMC Toolboxes, and then Risk Calculation Suite. In the toolbox, on the Earthquake Hazard Worksheet, the site coordinates and the source are input. Then the seismic hazard data is input. In the Flood Hazard Worksheet, the stage duration relationship is input. First, the elevation datum is selected, followed by the method for extrapolating the stage duration relationship and the required inputs. When period of record or detail level are selected, the stage duration used will be as input by the user. If screening level is selected, the user will be prompted for a set of inputs and the spreadsheet will extrapolate the stage duration relationship to the upper bound peak reservoir stage defined. For this method, only the period of record is input in the yellow cells at the bottom of the sheet. The spreadsheet will automatically add the upper bound stage input from the prior step. Next, the exposure and life loss consequence estimates can be input which will be used in a later step to calculate the average annual incremental life loss. In the risk screening worksheet, the user will define the headwater and peak ground acceleration partitions to evaluate. Earthquake and flood thresholds can be input at the top of the sheet. If these thresholds are left blank, the spreadsheet will return a true joint loading probability matrix. When defined, the spreadsheet assumes failure will not occur for earthquakes in stages less than the defined thresholds. The spreadsheet will also calculate an annual probability of failure, assuming certain failure, a system response equal to one, above these thresholds. This is useful information when screening potential failure modes. When the calculated annual probability of failure is very low, the failure mode can likely be excluded without additional analysis. Also in the risk screening worksheet, the average annual incremental life loss is calculated using the life loss consequences and the earthquake and flood threshold inputs. This brings us to exercise 3.2, where we will use the RMC joint loading probability toolbox to create a joint loading matrix. Please pause the video now to complete the exercise and press play once you've finished. We will start by copying the earthquake hazard data and pasting it as values into the table under step three of the earthquake hazard worksheet in the toolbox. Next, copy the stage duration relationship and paste it into the table towards the bottom of the flood hazard worksheet. We are told a detailed level was used as the method for extrapolating the stage duration relationship, so we will select that option from the dropdown. On the consequences worksheet, input the day and night exposure. For this example, we are told to assume a 10 hour workday. Next, we will copy the breach and non-breach life loss from the companion spreadsheet and paste its values into the life loss table on the consequences worksheet. Next, on the risk screening worksheet, we will input the earthquake and flood thresholds that we want to consider. And then input the headwater and PGA intervals to evaluate. We were given the headwater intervals in the companion spreadsheet, so we can copy and paste those in. For the PGA, the highest PGA evaluated was 1G, so we can use the preset intervals and simply delete the accelerations greater than 1G. The headwater intervals must include a value for the defined flood threshold elevation, and the PGA intervals must include a value for the defined earthquake threshold PGA, else a warning will be displayed. 
Now we have our completed joint loading matrix. Assuming a system response of 1 for all coincident loadings above the set thresholds, we get an APF of 3.66 times 10 to the minus 4, as shown shaded in red at the bottom of the screen. As such, we would be unable to screen this potential failure mode out based on coincident loading alone. Assuming a system response probability of 1 for coincident loadings above the set thresholds results in an average annual life loss of 8.27 times 10 to the minus 1. Gated spillways add additional complexity because of the number of components and all the different ways a breach can happen during an earthquake. The method for performing risk calculations for concrete spillway failures subjected to seismic hazard is different from the evaluation of typical hydrologic potential failure modes because the failure of structural components, such as gates, piers, and anchorages, can be combined and can result in several different breach sizes, typically given by a number of spillway gates or monoliths. This can become complicated because the failure of a given component can result in several different breach scenarios. For example, a gate failure for a four-gate concrete structure could result in a one-gate breach, two-gate breach, three-gate breach, or four-gate breach, depending on the failure combination. Therefore, the method for calculating the annual probability of failure and average annual life loss for a concrete spillway structure includes the use of combinatronics to develop equations for a discrete breach size that include the probability of failure or non-failure of multiple concrete spillway components. The project that we will evaluate for this example is a gated concrete spillway with two tainer or radial gates. Each gate has a corresponding end anchorage, and the spillway contains one reinforced concrete pier between the gates. During a seismic event, the spillway can fail due to a failure of the pier, PFM1, failure of one or both spillway gates, PFM2, or failure of one or both end anchorages, PFM3. Failure of the reinforced concrete pier always results in a breach of both spillway gates, while the failure of a single tainer gate or single end anchorage results in a breach of one spillway gate. Our task for the example is to calculate the marginal PFM risk for PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3, as well as the total risk of the spillway. The first step in the risk calculation process for seismic potential failure modes is to complete a joint loading probability matrix. The headwater and PGA relationships have already been discretized into five even intervals. Like we did for the prior example, linearly interpolate from the stage duration relationship to calculate the duration exceedance probability or DEP for each headwater elevation in the table. Drag the formula over to fill in the rest of the table. Add a greater than sign in cell K51 to remove the error that comes from dragging the formula. Calculate the probability for each interval by subtracting the DEP for headwater B from the DEP for headwater A. Add the non-exceedance for this first interval. Repeat that process for the seismic hazard, but because PGA is plotted on a logarithmic scale, use linlog int to do semi-log interpolation. As we did for the headwater, override the error in cell D58 by typing in a greater than sign. We are told not to include non-exceedance for the seismic hazard because we are assuming that the system response is zero for all PGAs less than 0.05G. So we can take the AEP of PGAA and subtract from it the AEP of PGAB. Drag the formula down to complete the column. Then calculate the joint probability by multiplying the two probabilities together. 
lock the row for the headwater probabilities, and lock the column for the PGAs. Here is a completed table. Because we are considering a PGA threshold and did not include non-exceedance, the sum of these values will not equal 1. This time, the sum of the values will be equal to the AEP of PGA A from the first interval, which is 6.90 times 10 to the minus 3. Now that the joint loading probability matrix is complete, we turn our attention to the marginal risk. For PFM1, we will start by interpolating to get the system response probabilities for all coincident loadings. We are told to use by lin lin log int when interpolating, and we'll use the midpoint headwater and midpoint PGA for the interval being evaluated. Next, we need to do some event tree math to calculate the annual probability of failure. In this example, a peer failure will always result in a two-gate breach. So the APF for a one-gate breach is simply zeros across the board. Even though we know that the APF is zero for a one-gate breach and that the average annual life loss will be zero, we will continue with the calculations because the calculations for this part, when evaluating the other failure modes, will follow the same procedure. Calculate the exposure weighted incremental life loss for each coincident loading. The exposure weighted incremental life loss is equal to the day exposure times the difference between the one gate breach day life loss and the day non breach life loss, plus the night exposure times the difference between the one gate breach night life loss and the night non-breach life loss. Once we have the incremental life loss table filled out, multiply it by the annual probability of failure to get the average annual life loss for each coincident loading. We can sum the annual probability of failures to get the total one gate breach annual probability of failure then sum the average annual life losses to get the total one gate breach average annual life loss for PFM1. Because the annual probability of failure is zero for this scenario, there is no end bar because you cannot divide by zero. Now we need to work on the two gate breach tables. Per the failure mode of entry, we multiply the joint loading probability by the peer failure system response to get the annual probability of failure. We can then drag over and down to complete the table. Next, we calculate the exposure weighted incremental life loss as we did for the one gate breach scenario, but this time using the two gate breach life loss numbers. The average annual life loss is the annual probability of failure multiplied by the exposure weighted incremental life loss. We can drag it over and down to complete the table. Sum up the two gate annual probability of failures. Sum up the two gate average annual life losses. Then divide the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure to get n bar. The total for the failure mode will be the sum of the one gate and two gate breach results. So we sum the APFs. And we sum the average annual life losses. And we divide the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure to get n bar. That completes the calculations for the PFM1 marginal risk.
For PFM2 marginal risk, we will complete the same set of calculations, starting with interpolating to fill out the system response table. The event tree math will be a little different for PFM2 than for PFM1. Because there are two gates, there are two different ways a one gate breach can result. The results of those two branches will be summed to get the PFM2 one gate breach. So following the event tree math, we start with the joint loading probability and multiply it by the quantity of the product of gate one failing and gate two not failing, plus the product of gate one not failing and gate two failing. For the two gate breach, both gates one and two need to fail. So for the annual probability of failure calculation, we will multiply the joint loading probability by the system response, and then again by the system response as dictated by the event tree math, because there are two gates, and each gate has the same system response probability. Drag the formula over and down to complete the table. From there, we complete the one gate and two gate breach calculations using the same procedure as before. Here's the one gate breach tables. And here is the two gate breach tables. Repeat the calculations for PFM3. Failure of an N anchorage results in the failure of one gate, so the calculations will be like those of PFM2 gate failure. Here's the annual probability of failure for the one gate breach scenario. The two branches that result in a one gate breach, failure of N anchorage one, and failure of N anchorage two were summed together to get these values. Here is the annual probability of failure for the two gate breach scenario. Both end anchorages must fail. Therefore, the annual probability of failure for the two gate breach is the joint loading probability times the system response times the system response again. Interpolate to get your life loss and calculate the average annual life loss. Here are the results for the one gate breach. And here are the results for the two gate breach. At this point, we've calculated the marginal risk for all three of our potential failure modes. Now we need to combine all the potential failure modes to calculate the total project risk. In order to correctly calculate the total risk, we need to use the joint risk model to capture all the discrete failure combinations just as we did for the individual potential failure modes. While this process was relatively simple and straightforward for calculating marginal PFM risk, it gets more complicated when combining and calculating the total risk because of the number of possible outcomes. We'll use the same event tree model to derive the total risk equations as we use for the marginal PFM risk calculations. But the total risk of entry contains every spillway component, pier, gates, and end anchorage. The first node in the tree is for the pier and contains two scenarios, pier non-failure and pier failure. Next is the gate with four scenarios, followed by the end anchorage, also with four scenarios. What we end up with is 31 different failure combinations and one non-failure combination for a total of 32 distinct ways that failure or non-failure can occur. The next step is one that is not easily shown. Using the event tree, failure equations for each breach size must be combined into total failure equations for a one gate breach and two gate breach by summing them together. This is the same process that we went through for the marginal PFM calculations but the total risk equations are functions of the failure or non-failure of the peer, gates, and end anchorages.
which makes them more complicated. This is a tedious process, and it can be easy to make mistakes if you're not careful. Here's the table for the one gate breach annual probability of failure that results from the event tree math. Stepping into the equation for the first coincident loading, you can see just how complicated the formula is. We are adding together all the results from all the event tree pathways that result in a one gate breach. If you do not try to do the calculation on their own, pause the video and take some time to look through the solution file so that you fully understand where each piece of the equation is coming from and why. We do the same thing for the two-gate breach scenario and sum all the event tree pathways that result in a two-gate breach. Stepping into the equation for the first coincident load, you can see that the formula is even more gnarly. There are a lot of terms that need to be summed together. It is not all that difficult to understand what is going on but it can be difficult to keep track of all the pieces when putting this very long formula together. Here is the resulting average annual life loss, calculated the same way as we did for the marginal risk estimates. First, for the one gate breach scenario, followed by the two gate breach scenario. Sum up the one gate annual probabilities of failure. Sum up the one gate average annual life losses. Calculate n bar. Sum up the two gate annual probabilities of failure. Sum up the two gate average annual life losses. Calculate n bar. Add the one gate breach and two gate breach annual probabilities of failure. Add the one gate breach and two gate breach average annual life losses. And divide the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure to get n bar. And finally, that completes the example. It was a lot of work and a lot to keep track of to do these calculations in a spreadsheet, but great practice. In Module 6, we will use RMC Total Risk and leverage the joint risk model built into the software to complete these calculations much more quickly and easily. The last topic that we are going to cover in Module 3 is Risk Reduction Evaluation. For modification studies and feasibility studies, the first step in evaluating risk reduction measures is to look at the potential failure mode event trees and identify where in the tree a given measure is going to reduce the risk. These measures can be structural or non-structural. Typically, structural measures will target the performance and reduce the system response, but they can also impact the flood loading or stage duration relationships. For example, if we were to make a physical modification and add an auxiliary spillway, the flood hazard would be impacted. Non-structural measures primarily target the incremental consequences, but some non-structural measures, like a change in the operation schedule, can change the flood loading or stage duration relationships. In a risk reduction evaluation, we are evaluating the change from a baseline condition. In our formulation process, this baseline condition is known as the future without action condition, or FWAC. Then, you are going to consider and quantify how the risk changes with an implemented risk management plan, or the future with federal action condition. To evaluate the risk reduction, we can look at the change in the risk assessment outputs of annual probability of failure, the incremental average annual life loss, and the incremental average annual economic cost. The change can be presented as a percentage by looking at the change from the original condition and dividing by the original condition.
The change will typically be negative because the risk reduction measures being evaluated should hopefully reduce the risk. Because the change in an annual probability of failure, incremental average annual life loss, and incremental average annual economic cost that are associated with a measure or plan can be orders of magnitude, it is helpful to report the order of magnitude change, which can be calculated as the difference in the logarithms of the values. We will also calculate the cost to save a statistical life for each risk management plan or RMP. Cost to save a statistical life is a measure of the cost effectiveness or efficiency of a risk management plan. The numerator is a measure of the net annual cost of the risk management plan, and the denominator is a measure of the life safety risk reduction. The Corps of Engineers uses this in a slightly different way than it was originally developed because we calculate it for every measure, but traditionally it is not calculated or considered until risks are first reduced to tolerable levels. In that application, it is used to determine if measures to further reduce risks below tolerable levels are justified. The first term in the equation is the annual implementation cost of the risk management plan. Typically, this is the construction cost of the measure annualized over the period of analysis that will be provided by the cost engineer with some input from planning. If the risk management plan were to include a reservoir restriction, the loss benefits would be included in this term. This term also includes any annualized first costs and annual operation costs associated with a non-structural risk reduction measure in the risk management plan such as downstream community emergency preparedness, warning, and response measures. The second term is the change in the average annual economic cost. This is equal to the baseline average annual economic cost, which will be for the FWAC, or for an intermediate staged implementation condition, minus the average annual economic cost after implementation of the risk management plan or after a subsequent staged implementation condition. The final term in the numerator is the change in operation and maintenance cost. These are the actual costs required to properly maintain the project, if not constrained by funding. For the change in the O&M cost, it is not necessary to estimate the average annual equivalent O&M cost of the future without action condition and risk management plan separately, because the change due to the risk management plan is what is important. There are a couple of examples listed here. When the change is less than zero, there is an increase in the annual O&M cost. This can occur, for example, when the risk management plan includes the addition of a tow drain and relief well system, because that system will need to be inspected and cleaned periodically. Or perhaps new piezometers were installed that need to be read. When the change is greater than zero, the reduction in the annual O&M cost has decreased. This could be for a cutoff wall that replaces the need for a tow drain system such that the periodic inspection, cleaning, and repair of that system that used to occur is no longer needed. The denominator of the cost to save a statistical life calculation contains the change in the incremental life safety risk. In most cases, we will be comparing a risk management plan back to the future without action condition. But comparisons can also be made to an intermediate step. This has not been done very often, but an example of an intermediate staged implementation condition would be if a dam foundation were to be grouted in preparation for a cutoff wall. But then, based on the information obtained and the risk reduction achieved by the grouting, decide later if the cutoff wall is actually necessary. The Risk Management Center has developed the RMC Risk Management Plans Toolbox as part of the RMC Risk Calculation Suite of Microsoft Excel spreadsheets to help you with these calculations. The spreadsheet tools contained in this toolbox quantitatively assess the effectiveness and efficiency of risk reduction for an array of risk management plans, including as low as reasonably practicable 
or ALARP considerations to help risk-informed decision-making. This spreadsheet can be downloaded from the RMC website. Click Software from the navigation bar, hover over RMC Toolboxes, then RMC Calculation Suite, and the download link for the toolbox will be at the bottom right. This concludes Module 3 of the course. Be sure to complete Homework 3 to get credit for completing this module. In Homework 3, you are given the risk assessment data for a seismic embankment failure mode and asked to complete the risk calculations. Once complete, please send your completed homework to RMC Training at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105, Homework 3, to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you miss the live session, a recording will be posted to the RMC website. Thanks, everyone.